Income tax 2023-2024, what is listed property? Get ready and some coffee because tax season is a time when we test out our math skills, question our life choices, and try desperately to cling to some sense of sanity as the government gaslights us with crazy stuff. You know, I don't care... I don't care how many times you say it, government. Two plus two does not equal five. Two plus two does not equal five. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because, apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deductions, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income the sole proprietorship schedule c rolling into line one income of the formula schedule c itself also basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses which you could call business deductions resulting in net business income which is in essence what rolls in from the schedule c to line one of the formula the formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040 of which we see the first page here the schedule c ultimately rolling into line number eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income schedule c rolling into line three business income or loss this is finally the schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement format income and expenses sections we're focused down here on the expenses, some expenses being more difficult than others, such as, for example, depreciation, where, as we've seen in prior presentations, even if we're using a cash-based system, the tax code might force us to do an accrual thing. For example, if we had a $10,000 piece of equipment, we would like to just expense it as like equipment expense but no the irs is probably going to make us put it on the books as an asset which makes sense from a generally accepted accounting standpoint but we don't have a balance sheet we only have a profit and loss therefore we're going to have a depreciation schedule giving us the balance sheet asset account of property plant and equipment and related accumulated depreciation as well as calculating the current periods depreciation expense we then saw that we have those upfront depreciations that could be taken, possibly the 179 and the special depreciations, which might give us the whole amount deductible upfront as though we just expensed it in the first place, leading to the question, why didn't you just let me do the cash-based thing to start out with? And of course, the answer is the tax code got all messed up and complex because they they wanted the normal accrual concept of depreciation but then they got into the lobbyists and the politics and whatnot and they put in the 179 deduction and the special depreciations which deviate from normal accounting concepts and then uh anything that's the foundation that's left over after the 179 and special and the thing that we would expect even as laws change to be somewhat more constant as because it's based on generally accepted accounting principles. That's the maker's depreciation, uh, which is gonna be using usually like a straight line or double declining type of method. So that's the general outline. Now, as we put our depreciable property on the books, we have these accelerated depreciation methods, such as huge acceleration, 179 special depreciation, and then an accelerated maker's uh, depreciation with a double declining balance typically. 
And the IRS might be skeptical with some types of property, which we're going to be calling listed property, and they might have more restrictive rules, the big one usually being the car. So you put the automobile on the books, you might have more restrictions with it because, again, the IRS is skeptical that you didn't just buy the car to get you from point A to point B, which you would think would be what you would need it for normally for a business. Again, you can argue against that saying I need it for my image, for my advertising or whatever and so on. But generally the IRS is, that's why you would think they're putting in the listed property on things of like cars and whatnot to have, to have a limitation. Okay, listed property is any of the following. So passenger automobiles as defined later. Any other property used for transportation unless it is an accepted vehicle. So again, obviously when you're looking at cars, if it's just like a car that's driving one person to point A to point B, then then you would think that the IRS is likely going to be putting more restrictions on it. But you get into those muddy areas of the work trucks and whatnot, where you would think if the car is a giant septic tank or something like that, then it's not like a luxury automobile, right? And so you would think that it shouldn't be subject to kind of listed property rules in the same way. And how did the IRS try to deal with that? One way is you could say, well, if the truck is over a certain weight or something like that, maybe then we're going to call it uh, non-listed property. But then, of course, fancy SUVs and whatnot decided to make fancy big cars that are heavy. <laughs> to, so you can see how this whole thing gets kind of a messy, a messy situation because you're trying to determine, obviously, they would try to determine, is it a work vehicle and not the one that's a fancy vehicle partially for personal use, you would think is the general idea. All right, property generally used for entertainment, recreation, or amusement, including photographic, uh, phonographic, communication, and video recording equipment. So improvements to listed property. So an improvement made to listed property uh, that must be capitalized is treated as a new item of, pro of depreciable property. So let's say, of course, if we had the car or something like that and we did normal maintenance to it, then like normal, you would think the maintenance would be simply expensed, oil changes and whatnot to keep it in its current condition. But if we completely remodeled the car and now we've got some fancy modeled car or something like that, then if it was a depreciable item, you would have to put it on the books as an asset. So what do you do? Do you change the cost of the asset you already have on the books? Hopefully not, because that would be complex to do because you're already in the middle of depreciating it. So what you would typically do is put a new item on the books for the improvement and depreciate it, you would think, using the similar rules in place. So the recovery period and method of depreciation that apply to the listed property as a whole also apply to the improvement. So for example, if you must depreciate the listed property using the straight line method, you must also depreciate the improvement using the straight line method. Noting the straight line method would normally be if you're forced to use a straight line method, that's usually not as good as the double declining method because the double declining method, if it wasn't listed property, you might, you might imagine you'd get the double declining. If it is listed property, you might get the straight line. Why is that worse? because the double declining method usually gives you more depreciation up front. It should result in the same depreciation of the cost of the property over the life of the property, but it's gonna take longer. You're gonna get, you, you know, you're gonna get more depreciated at the, at the tail end as opposed to at the front end. All right, passenger automobiles. A passenger automobile is any four-wheel vehicle made primarily for use on public streets, roads, and highways and rated at uh, 6,000 pounds or less. So there's that arbitrary limit that they've tried to put in there, that 6,000 pounds or less of unloaded gross vehicle weight, 6,000 pounds or less of gross vehicle weight for trucks and vans. So it uh, includes any part, component, or other item physically attached to the automobile at the time of purchase or usually included in the purchase price of an automobile. So you can imagine once that 6,000 pounds becomes a limit that might impact the deductibility and being able to deduct more upfront than auto manufacturers now have an incentive possibly to play with that 6,000 pound limit as do people that own the car who might try to put like a, 
a work bed in it or something to try to make it, you know, you, you could imagine people trying to play with that 6,000 pounds that there's a significant tax implication, which actually kind of backfires to some of their other goals, which is usually like environmental soundness and whatnot and making heavy cars on purposely heavy just be to, for the tax code doesn't seem like a good incentive. But in any case, the following vehicles are not considered passenger automobiles for these purposes. So an automobile hearse or a combination ambulance hearse used directly in a trade or business. So clearly you would think most people aren't driving around like an ambulance hearse as a, a just because they like it, right? Unless you're the Ghostbusters or something, I don't know. So you would think that that would be a simply a work truck and therefore not subject to the more strict rules, you would think. A vehicle used directly in the trade or business of uh, transporting persons or property by pay uh, for pay or hire. So a truck or van that is qualified non-personal use vehicle. So qualified non-personal use vehicle, what does that even mean? So a qualified non-personal use vehicles are vehicles that by their nature are not likely to be used more than a minimal amount for personal purposes. So again, you can see the, the, the ship, the goal of the objective here. And if you have the goal of the objective in the mind, uh, as you're reading the law, then that might make it a little bit easier to understand, right? So, so obviously the idea would be, well, if it's non-personal, again, if you're driving around a septic tank, then, then you would think that, that you wouldn't have it as listed property, which has given you limitations on the depreciation because the thought is that it's going to be partially personal, possibly. So they include trucks and vans listed as uh, accepted vehicles under other property used for transportation next. They also include trucks and vans that have been specially modified so that they are not likely to be used more than a minimal amount of personal purposes. So, you know, you don't drive, you know, picking people up in the septic tank truck doesn't, isn't always that impressive of a look. Although, you know, there's some weird people out there, so you never know. So, <clears throat> such as by installation of permanent uh, shelving and painting the vehicle to display advertising or the company's name. So, for a detailed discussion of passenger automobiles, including leased passenger automobiles, see publication 463. So, other property used for transportation. Other property used for transportation includes trucks, buses, boats, airplanes, motorcycles, and any other vehicle used to transport persons or goods. Caution, although vehicles used to transport persons or property for pay or hire and vehicles rated at more than 6,000 pound threshold are not passenger automobiles. They are still, quote, other property used for transportation, end quote, and are subject to the special rules for listed property. Accepted vehicles. Other property used for transportation does not include the following qualified personal use vehicles defined earlier under passenger automobiles. So we've got clearly marked police and fire vehicles. So unmarked vehicles used by law enforcement officers in the use of officially authorized. So ambulances used as such and hearses used as such. So I'm not sure the Ghostbusters would work there because their hearse is used like not, you know, it's not really used in the same way. Anyway. So any vehicle with a loaded gross vehicle weight of over 14,000 pounds that is designed to carry cargo. So bucket trucks, cherry pickers, cement mixers, dump trucks, including garbage truck, flatbed trucks, and refrigerated uh, trucks. We have combines, cranes, and derricks and forklifts. Uh, delivery trucks with seating only for the driver or only for the driver plus a folded jump seat, qualified moving vans, qualified specialized utility repair trucks, school buses used in transporting students and employees of schools, other buses with a capacity of at least 20 passengers that are used as passenger buses, tractors and other special purpose farm vehicles. So clearly marked police and fire vehicles. A clearly marked police or fire vehicle is a vehicle that meets all the following conditions. It is owned or leased by a governmental unit or an agency or instrumentally of a governmental unit. 
It is required to be used for commuting by police officers or firefighters who, when not on a regular shift, is on call at all times. It is prohibited from being used for personal use other than commuting outside the limit of police officers' arrest powers of the firefighters' obligation to respond to an emergency. It is clearly marked with painted insignia or words that make it, make it readily apparent that it is a police or fire vehicle may, uh, a making or uh, on a license plate is not a clear marking. Okay, qualified moving van. What is that? A qualified moving van is any truck or van used by a professional moving company for the moving household or business goods if the following requirements are met. No personal use of the van is allowed other than for travel to and from a moving site or for minor personal use such as stop for lunch on the way from one move site to another. Personal use for travel to and from a move site uh, happens no more than five times a month on average. Uh, personal use is limited to situations in which it is more convenient to the employer because of the location of the employee's residence to uh, relation to the location of the move site for the move van to be returned to the employer's business location. All right, so then we have the qualified specialty utility repair truck. So a truck is a qualified specialized utility repair truck if it is not a van or pickup truck and all the following apply. So the truck was specifically designed for and is used to carry heavy tools, testing equipment and parts, shelves, racks or other permanent interior construction has been installed to carry and store the tools, equipment or parts and would make it unlikely that the truck would be used other than minimally for personal purposes. The employer requires the employee to drive the truck home in order to be able to respond to emergency situations for purposes of restoring or maintaining electricity, gas, telephone, water, sewer, or steam utility services.